like feel free to feel, join in at any point. If you have questions, feel free to pop on the chat or come off mute. So anyway, welcome everyone. So thank you so much for joining us. This is the uh, March 2022 version of Artist Think Tank. And if you're kind of new to this, this is something that we offer through the Slants Foundation every month. It's a kind of a resource and it's also a time to collaborate, to network with people in the industry and also those who are kind of your fellow creators uh, out there in, in various parts of the world. And it's also a, an opportunity for you to just kind of get like 100% like transparent answers to your questions. I, I feel like sometimes in the music industry, there's a little bit of a veil of or a mystery of like what steps to actually take, how, like how to progress in the music career without paying like a ton of money for consultants or, or things that are behind paywalls and that sort of thing. And while there's a lot of resources out there like podcasts and blogs and that sort of thing, we want to be able to provide you like actual uh, experiences from, from those of us who've been in the industry for a minute, but also in a way that like, we're not like financially incentivized to provide this information or to like hook you in some program or something like that. We, we were doing this because we, we care deeply about the community and we are really excited to, to learn more about your work and find ways to make it not only sustainable so that you can have like a lucrative and fulfilling career, but also scalable so that you can like learn how to build and expand upon your work in a way that is as meaningful for you and also that um, serves your goals. So tonight, I just wanted to share some thoughts about uh, authentic allyship, like how to collaborate with other artists and organizations, how to have authentic relationships uh, in a way that is meaningful for everybody involved. And I think this is a, a topic that's really close to my heart on both the artist side as well as the activist side, because on the, on the artist side, I oftentimes see a situation where sometimes musicians are seeing other artists as competition like as if there's a limited pool of resources or attention or fans uh, and and sometimes people kind of guard themselves and in doing so um, block out the opportunity for for a creative community and on top of that there obviously for many of the artists that we work with care a lot about impacting the culture and have social causes that are really near and dear to their hearts, but maybe don't really know how to reach out to organizations or work with them in a way that can actually create social impact that moves the needle on those uh, said causes. So I kind of want to explore the relationships first, like in our artist career, there are kind of three main types of relationships that you can have with other folks. Um, you can have creative relationships and that would be doing things like collaborating with other artists to, to make music. Maybe you write songs together, perform together. Uh, it could be folks that are working on production, mixing, audio engineering, and that sort of thing. Anything that has to do with your creative process or the expression and performance of those things. Uh, there's, and that's a huge field in of itself. Like you have everything from vocal coaches to performance consultants to a whole swath of people that just focus on songwriting and production. Um, in addition to the creative kind of a pool of relationships, you also have the business side of things. And these are people like booking agents, publicists, managers, uh, entertainment attorneys. But it could also involve with some of those uh, creatives as well, because they could just be people who help you understand the business of performing music, like what it's like to be a small business, because that's the reality of what it is to be an artist these days. You're kind of an artist entrepreneur. And so uh, there are different types of relationships in that area as well. And finally, the, the third kind of category for those artists uh, and artist activists would be kind of the social impact sector or nonprofit organizations. The, it, so even though there's like three kind of seemingly very disparate groups of people, what's really nice is that the same general principles apply on building those authentic relationships with them. 
And so I want to talk about how you can, you can do this in a meaningful manner in a way that is scalable. So depending on like, if you are just a, you know, a group of one, like if you're just an independent singer, songwriter, uh, performer, and, but you can also scale it up if you had like a band or if you had partnerships uh, with, with other people who are helping you in your career as well. So uh, one of the ways I like to think about like collaborations and partnerships is like, if that partnership didn't exist, would you be doing that kind of work anyway? Is it is it work that you can outsource or you can join with somebody on? Because the, the great thing about partnerships is that it's not just in addition to your team, whether it's creative business or otherwise, it is like a multiplier. It's kind of in the business sector, a lot of um, you hear, you hear this phrase a lot. They say one plus one equals three. And it's basically this idea that when you bring on a partner, it isn't just like double the amount of work that you can get done. It is actually, it magnifies it a whole bunch more than that. And the more partners you bring in or collaborators you could bring in, especially those with those authentic relationships, the more you can like really exponentially increase your impact in any of those areas of your career. So the number one principle of like reaching out to folks is you got to absolutely have very clear goals. Like this oftentimes is kind of the, the make or break part of your, of your career, especially as you are in the kind of beginning phases, like pre-album, pre-touring. It's, it's really, really important to have like goals. And so a lot of times people use this kind of acronym, like, oh, you got to have SMART goals. And um, SMART goals are basically goals that are specific, that are, they're measurable, they're attainable. So they're like realistic. Um, they're relevant to kind of where you are at the moment and they're time bound. So you have like a deadline, so to speak. And I actually like to add uh, two additional things. I think goals should be smarter that in addition to being things being specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound, it should involve everybody on your team, everybody in your kind of inner circle of people who you care about and they should be revisited often. And so we, we kind of like, I want to just spend a minute here just kind of like settling on, on this idea because a lot of times people will have a goal like, oh, I want to, I want to release an album, but that's, and while that is specific and then it's measurable, like you can determine if you actually release it or not, and maybe even have a deadline, uh, like, hey, I want to release it by January 15th, 2023. There are some like additional steps you could think of, of like, what does it mean to release that album? So for example, um, a question I oftentimes ask is like, what does success look like? Like, how do you measure it? Because for most of us as creatives, if you were to just simply release that album, we wouldn't necessarily call that a, a success if nobody listened to it. And so you could start thinking like, okay, um, maybe my goal is to actually get a certain number of streams or to sell physical product like, hey, we're going to press vinyl and I want to sell 500 copies of it between that January release date and maybe um, June. So like six months to sell those 500 copies. Now, all of a sudden you have something that's really tangible and that you can break apart in smaller bits and pieces. So for example, if you're like, well, how do we sell 500 copies uh, of our record in those six months? You know, okay, well, in order to, to get to that number, you have to sell about 80 copies uh, a month or um, roughly uh, 20 copies every single week. And then, so you can start doing the math, like, okay, how do we sell 20 copies of this record every week. Maybe it's through online sales and promotions. Maybe it's uh, through touring and, and playing a lot of shows. Maybe if you have a band and you, have, you say like, okay, there's four of us. All we have to do is make sure each person can sell five copies every week and then we'll hit our target. Now you can start creating like a plan for those kinds of things. And so when you approach a potential partner or collaborator, whether it's music, business, or social impact, it's important to have like goals like that in mind and because that way you 
they know that you have a very specific path and, and if, especially if they could see themselves in it, they're more likely to, to join you, especially if it aligns with goals that are important to them. So the second part of like having like smart or smarter, smarter goals is that they also have to be goals that other people could see themselves in. Like it has to be meaningful to them in their own terms. And when you do that, you're going to be much more likely to have people who are not only like agreeable to be working with you, but who are like deeply excited about working with you because it means so much more to them. So a couple months ago, in one of our earlier artist think tank sessions, on, I did one on like how to get sponsorships and endorsements. And it's on our YouTube channel. It's on our Facebook if you want to look it up. Uh, but I, I oftentimes share this story about like how our band became like one of the first uh, artists that Fender had. They used to call them highlight artists where they would kind of spotlight artists on their, their website. And we were actually the first Asian American artists that they ever had. And what shocked a lot of people is like, I got Fender as a, as a brand partner of ours just months after starting the band. And the, the way that I did this wasn't like super novel. I just, I was just emailing people and I was like, Hey, uh, I would ask them a question and I would say something like how many disco punk uh, Asian bands can you name? And like, so it uh, immediately get them start thinking about this sort of thing. And then for Fender specifically, I was like, you, you all sell this Hello Kitty guitar. What are you doing to sell that guitar at, or, or market it at anime conventions? And I didn't really think a whole lot about it. Cause you know, honestly, I was just shooting a lot of emails to a lot of different people. But I remember getting the phone call from Billy Siegel, who's the vice president of global operations at the time. And he, he called me while I was actually at an anime convention. And he says, Simon, you know, we get like about 500 pitches every single week. And usually I have one of my artist relations staff call, like email them and that sort of thing. I never call them. But you know why I'm calling you today? It's because you asked me a question that I couldn't answer. And he's like, so I didn't even know there was a thing like anime conventions were a thing. So he's like, so what can you do to, to, to help make this happen for us? Like he started asking me about that target audience that was like, ex, you know, extremely relevant to their interests. And, you know, it was just a blind spot for them. And I was like, well, you know, we're touring or playing anime conventions. So we're already building authentic relationships with this audience. And what was kind of fun is like, he says to me, like he starts explaining to me what an artist endorsement program looks like at Fender. And it's, it's pretty standard across the music industry that if you are an artist that endorses musical products and you have this official relationship, what you do is you get an artist endorsement discount. So you get like 40 to 60% off uh, suggested retail price. Uh, and that's kind of like the baseline for the relationship. And then sometimes you can do some additional stuff from there. So he's explaining the program to me. He's like, you know, people don't just get free guitars. Like even if Eric Clapton calls me and he wants to do something for charity, he doesn't get free guitars and, and that sort of thing. And I was just like, I knew I had a, like just a small window of time to like really stand out from every other artist out there that they, every other artist relationship they had. So I said, I just interrupted him. I was like, excuse me, um, with all due respect, Eric Clapton's not going to sell your Hello Kitty guitars, but I will. And he's just like, oh, <laughs> and he's just kind of like, okay, like, so what do you suggest? And I was like, okay, well, you know, in six months from now, we're going to be playing this huge anime convention in Seattle, Washington called Soccer Con. It's got like over 12,000 people attending this thing. What I want you to do is give me two Hello Kitty guitars. Like one, because I want to give it to my publicist's daughter as a present. And the second is to give it away in a contest. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, what, what goal would you have? Like, what would you call a successful relationship? And he said, he starts saying like, we need more email addresses and contact information, especially if we get demographic information. So I was like, okay, what's the best contest you ever had? And it told me about this giveaway they did for like a guitar and they got like 300 entrants. So I was like, okay, if I can't meet or beat 300 entries into you, like into this contest, I'll buy these guitars from you full price. But if 
I can pass that goal. You give these to us for free and we have a different type of relationship than you have from every other artist that you work with. And so with that kind of bet on the line, he was just like, oh, obviously this guy who I've never heard of and this band who's just started a few months ago, like understands our goals, understands our audience. And what was great is I, I used the same conversation with other people that I knew would have a stake in this. So I contacted the convention. I was like, hey, uh, we got this great giveaway. We're going to give away these Hello Kitty guitars. Could you feature it on, on the front page of the website? Could you email every person registered for this thing and let them know to sign up? And maybe we'll package it with other things. They agreed to. Then I contacted the um, two largest anime magazines out there. And I was like, hey, we got these, uh, this giveaway. And if you want access to this exclusive list of people registered for this contest who are at this, like one of the biggest anime conventions in the country, could you give us free ads in your magazine? And so they jumped on board as well. And then we packaged it to get together with like other prizes of other people who wanted access to this list. And so at the end of this campaign, I was able to go to, to Fender and we built a custom form for it and everything and was able to give them over 12,000 entrants, the biggest contest they ever did in the history of the company. So not only did we get those guitars for free, but he also let me custom design my own line of basses. And later that, uh, a year later, we gave away like my signature edition of that same bass. And it's 2022 now. It has been um, uh, 15 years since we started working with Fender and we still work on stuff together. That's an example of like a authentic relationship when you have a very clear set of, of shared goals, especially goals that are articulated in a way that others can see themselves in, because that's how you can really make a meaningful impact. And again, it was measurable. It had a specific deadline. It involved everybody on that team. It was relevant to our interests. And so it had all those characteristics of like a smarter goal. The other part of having uh, a relationship is that you also want to codify it. So in addition to having those goals, you want to have some kind of written agreement or a set of expectations and responsibilities and things that are articulated in advance. The worst thing you could do is like start working with somebody, but not actually have any of those things outlined. And it becomes a really frustrating experience for everybody involved because they don't know what's expected of them. They might not know what their deliverables are, and they might not have a good understanding of what's on the line if they don't fulfill their duties. The reality is like everybody is busy. And so the more clear that you can outline what the relationship looks like, the better they can understand upfront if it's worth their time getting involved and, and building that relationship. And also uh, they can tell you not only about their capacity, but it might also show other opportunities available. Like maybe as you're working together, they might say like, you know what? this is not an area of expertise of mine, but I could introduce you to someone else. And that was something I found over the years, particularly working with like nonprofit organizations that are oftentimes really stretched in terms of like their staff ability to, to work with us on different marketing campaigns. So we would kind of loop in like a third partner and then have the same kind of outline. And the thing is, even if you're doing something like, hey, we want to work with a nonprofit to to highlight a cause that they care about, to drive traffic to them, you still wanna have those things like articulated in advance because it holds yourself accountable and it lets them know that you're taking that really, really seriously. Whether it is like um, a limited duration relationship, like, okay, we're gonna work on this one campaign or it's like an ongoing relationship, like you still want to, demonstrate that you have this commitment. And if, especially if you can get like kind of a written agreement or even just like a spelled out email, it lets everybody involved know like what the stakes are. And, and it, they will generally take it more seriously, but more importantly, they will have like clarity of vision in terms of like how they can get involved as well. So like another example of like having like these kind of goals and codifying it is like, uh, about five years ago, 
our band was working with uh, the ACLU uh, and because they had helped us out on our Supreme Court case that like when our band was fighting uh, the government for like a decade or so. And, you know, we wanted to demonstrate like some serious appreciation to them, but also to highlight other issues that they were working on. So one of the things that we did is like, I was like, you know what? everybody's got these like tiny desk concerts, like NPR submission, people like film it. And it just kind of goes in the, the depths of YouTube. And, and many of these artists like hope like someone will watch it, especially someone at NPR who likes it enough to invite them into Washington DC to like play and record a session. And I was like, what if we did our own version of a tiny desk concert, but we'll do it inside the offices of the ACLU. And I was like, it'd be kind of a fun spin on it. Like we'll go there, we'll perform, and then we'll talk, we'll kind of interview or be interviewed by their staff to like talk about causes that are near and dear to our hearts. And so again, like this could just be kind of a vague agreement or a campaign, but we're like, no, like let's like really lock it down. We'll have a specific date uh, where we're gonna be there on tour. Let's talk about like the, the technical aspects of this. We decided to have it live streamed on uh, the ACLU uh, Facebook uh, page and then like to upload those videos later on. But let me tell you, like live stream is definitely the way to go, especially for this kind of thing. It just makes such a unique and rich experience. And we just stopped in and one afternoon and like before one of our sh shows that night and we, we said like they had their staff all ready to go. But um, the, the really fun thing is like we also got because we had all this stuff in prepared in advance, I gave them assets like photos of the band, videos of that sort of thing. For the many months leading up to it, their social team was just blasting about our band and like talking about our case and, and our like kind of joint cause to like rev up excitement for this thing so that when we actually went live, we had a quarter million people watching us in the middle of the afternoon play in the cubicles of their office. And it just became like this wonderful relationship. It, a limited duration because it wasn't like we were saying, Hey, we're just going to keep doing this for all time. Well, we, we want to like figure out like what it would take to do this one event and how can we get the most out of the event for, for the organization. And as a result, of course, they just showed us a whole lot of love and it just drove uh, streams and sales and other things to, to, to our band because their audience was like, love the fact that we were all aligned and they wanted to support us in addition to donating uh, money to the ACLU, uh, volunteering and, and that sort of thing. And I've done this with other artists as well. We've like, let me tell you, if you like, for example, if you like animals, you can easily do a live stream concert in like a humane society or no kill shelter and have a bunch of puppies and kittens around. I guarantee you that is like gold in terms of like, social content uh because like if you're like hey adopt this little puppy like that's really really cool it's it's fun and let me tell you if you submit that to npr as a tiny desk concert you'll probably get a lot more traction than if you're just like in your living room or that sort of thing so like the cool thing about these kinds of things is it provides a lot of opportunities for creativity because when you actually put it down on paper you can say like oh what are some really interesting ways that uh, we can bring this to life. And so having clear goals, uh, figuring out the type of relationship that you want, codifying it. And then the reason why we codify it is really to have accountability. And that's kind of that third big piece to this kind of thing. And when I talk about accountability is that you want to have like very, very specific action items. And so a lot of times I use the, the big uh, questions who, like who's involved, you know, who on their team, as well as your own, what are they responsible for? When is this going to happen? Like, what are the specific deadlines or targets that, uh, that you've set in stone? So like, and like, what will it look like in terms of timeline? So if you're working on a campaign, do you need to meet every so often? Like, if so, get those dates on the calendar in advance, especially when you're working with business on the business end, like if you're working with a corporate sponsor or a nonprofit partner, because they get really, really busy. It, what's also great about getting those deadlines in advance is you can ask them, like, what are some priority dates for you? Are there certain seasons where uh, you get a lot busier and maybe you have less capacity? Are there certain 
targets that you have for yourself because you know the, this is a really important season for your industry or do you have a legislative bill that you're working on that you want to get passed because then you could start thinking like okay how can i work with them on that timeline and then uh ask yourself that the how question like okay how are we going to execute and then of course why like what are what are the overarching goals that we that everybody can uh, see themselves in and when you ask the question like what does success look like it could be a very clear articulated sense of what that looks like for you and the the partners that you're working with and so this same framework again can work on the creative side like whether it's like hey i want to collaborate with somebody on a song maybe i want to get somebody for some like pre uh, mixing production consult consulting or uh, want to work with a mastering engineer or booking agent like you can use these same principles of like the shared goals having like a, a actual written commitment that's codified and then the accountability piece uh, it, it, and it just keeps everybody on top of it and you know more clear in terms of like the, the more clear that you are in terms of the roles and what's expected of people, the more that they're likely to live up to those things, as opposed to like a vague relationship, like, oh, let's just work together. It'd be really cool if we just worked on some songs. Like it, it's really much better to, to have that stuff in advance. So those are kind of the main things that I, I wanted to cover, but I also wanted to provide like plenty of uh, time for, for your questions, or if you have a situ, situation or something like that that you want like some feedback on, I'm happy to, to answer those or weigh in on that as well. Uh, yeah, uh, so my, my question, hey, again, is, uh, is not so much um, on topic. Do you want me to say that for like? No, feel free to, yeah. Um, this, this is your time now, so. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't know if you, well, you guys can edit. Uh, so like, like I said, like me and my brother are playing uh, the APCA next Thursday. And our main goal is to book as many college shows as we can. Uh, so what would be your advice as far as um, uh, the best strategies to accomplish that? Yeah, so I think um, particularly at events where there's a lot of artists showcasing and there's a, actually a few artists who will probably be showing up who don't have a showcase, the, you want people walking away thinking about you and remembering you. So what can you do to stand out? What makes you different than everybody else? That's something that you would really, really want to lean in on. And like, how can you find the right uh, decision makers who are aligned in that vision, who, who care about the things that you care about as well. So like, what would you think, what, what are some things that make you stand out that make you different than like any other artists that you could think of? Yeah, uh, we're twin brothers. We like both sing lead vocals and harmonize. And um, that's kind of a big, uh, I guess, selling point. Um, we're super energetic we're going to be the most energetic band there like we do like guitar flips uh we do like ninja moves on stage um um we're filipino american we're i i don't i didn't see any other asian bands or maybe a couple of per, uh, performers but no definitely no other asian bands so that's it's pretty rare in that scene. So, so, so you could take each of these attributes, right. And start thinking like, how do we leverage it or how, like through the lens of the college, how can we use it as a way to um, make it a selling point or something that they will find compelling. So for, for example, if you're like, Hey, you know, we're, we're one of the few Asian artists out there. Do you, you know, both, um, May is a really important month for Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, but a lot of college events also do stuff in the month of April, especially if their semester runs a little bit short. So maybe a selling point is like, not only can you perform, but you can also do something special for like the Asian, Asian student unions at the various colleges, uh, particularly in that market, if you can provide some kind of programming, maybe it's like 
it, it could be something creative, like, hey, this is how we do songwriting and performance, like this is a kind of workshop style. But it could also be like, here are causes that we care about. And we can do like workshops or like discussions or a round table uh, kind of format of things like in those areas as well. So like if you if you make that really clear, like colleges are always looking for not only like performers because like students want to have fun, but if they can pair it up with like, okay, I can see how I can bring a class to this and make it extra credit. Like if, if faculty can have a buy-in, your your odds of getting booked are much, much higher because they don't see it as just entertainment. Now it's programming as well as entertainment. So cultural heritage months are a great way to do that. Maybe, um, you know, there's been a lot of documentaries lately on like, and particularly in like social studies around like twins and triplets, like the differences and similarities. So maybe you could say like, hey, there's some really cool like docu-series on Netflix or um, some, some other programs. And you can also talk, like speak from your own experiences, like how real, like, <laughs> like what's, what's, what's true to you and, and your uh, twin relationship and what's not. And that could be fun, compelling things for certain classes as well. So like any kind of like, if you think about it from the lens of like a college, like if you were the dean of a college and and some students came up to you and say, I really want to book this band, if, and if the college is saying like, how does this relevant to our academic needs? Think about like what, what uh, classes or programs that are out of school that could be relevant to each of those things that you spoke of. And, and, and that's how you really get that buy-in so that it's not only like, a good like fun time, but it's a really good value for the school. And on top of that, you can also sell kind of like those add on things like, hey, you know what, um, this is a, this is the price point for our performance for our band. But if you want to do like X number of workshops and other things, we can do that. It just requires, you know, like an extra few hundred bucks or, or whatever it is that you want to do. So it, it could both be an upsell as well as something that like is very, very clear in terms of the alignment there. And then, so as you have that list, make sure like when you hand out uh, flyers or, or, or things like that, if you get a if you get a banner at, at your booth, which I, all those things I definitely recommend, like having a lot of visuals, make sure all those things are speaking to those goals. So it's like very, very consistent across the board. When you perform, I, cause you, you said you have a showcase, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as you introduce yourself, like, make the most of every second the, the reality is like they're not going to care about the names of your songs so don't don't be introducing the songs use like hey did you know this fun that you know like we're we're we're, we're turning brothers we we do these kinds of things like and we're also really excited because like um you know April and May are coming up. It's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Uh, and, or you could talk about the fact that the numerous states across the country right now are considering uh, making Asian American studies uh, required in the curriculum. And like, you'd be happy to like talk about your own heritage and, and figures and, 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 and history. Uh, or you can like pull out some really cool like facts about you know if, if you want to like put your your ethnic identity and heritage like front and center you can also talk about those sort of things as well like hey did you know like filipino americans like were some of the first re residents here like we had filipinos in here before we had cowboys in the united states you know we we helped built up new orleans and and the fishing industry and like did you know a lot of the foods that you, <laughs> you eat are actually stemming from our experience like there's all kinds of fun stuff that you can like put in there as you're performing. So that's another way to like tie that message in so that when they are watching you, like that story is probably gonna stick more than, than the song in a lot of ways. And then as they walk up to the booth, they're like, oh, you were that group. Like, cause they're gonna see the same message there. And then, you know, when they take those materials away they'll remember the performance and then be much more likely to, to contact you. And then on top of that, you, you got a copy of the, every uh, attendee. So when, when, you, when you do the follow-up messages, use the same like bullet point format. Like, hey, we were the group that can do X, Y, and Z. And we would love to come to your school and work with you to develop a program. Mm, that's awesome. Oh, wow. Um, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, what, uh, what's, is there a time frame you recommend following up? Like, 
the next day, a couple of days later. Um, is there, it, should there be a pre, uh, should I, should I contact them before the conference at all? I, it, it, I can't quite recall the rules on like contact. If you get access to it in advance, you can say something like, Hey, we're looking forward to seeing you there. Here's our, uh, you know, showcase time. And then like a quick blurb about us. And so like you kind of offer a little bit of a teaser, I would say, keep it brief. And in terms of follow-up, I would say uh, probably about a week or so afterwards, because a, a, you know, a lot of people travel for it and sometimes it falls uh, right before a spring break uh, from what I recall. And so you just want to hit them where like what you know, they'll be sitting in front of their desk and then they've had a chance to like process and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, Garrett, do you have any questions? Um, I do not. That's that's great. Wow. Um, yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah. So, Tanya, did you have any questions or anything you're like hoping to get some feedback on? Yeah, something that you were talking about kind of resonated with me in that uh, something I've been struggling to do a lot is try to find my own like uh, musical and uh, like artist identity. I think that I struggle a lot with, you know, making my sounds, my sound different from anybody else and kind of trying to figure out what story I have to tell. I went down one route for a while of, you know, being like a very kind of slow and like, uh, like guitar based writer, like an acoustic guitar based writer. But I like, I felt like that was kind of stifling and not very interesting to me personally. And so I want to try and take a different route, but I'm not sure how I will know, like how I will like find what I'm interested in and how I'll know uh, what I've gotten or like when I've gotten there. Yeah, well, I, I could say that sometimes it takes a little bit to find your artist identity and, and that's totally okay. I would say like, you know, you found it when like you yourself are excited about it. When you, when you can say like, I wish I saw this in the world and then you can be that. And when you're not worried about if there's enough of a market for it or anything, but you just want to do it because you want to go all in since you wish you had it. That's when you know you're getting really, really close to that kind of North star of what, what should be guiding you. So I think a lot of times when we think about um, artist identities, one thing that I hear a lot from artists is that they're, they kind of think they're afraid that they're too much of a niche where it's like too specific. But I think that um, oftentimes it's important to be as specific as possible because that is what distinguishes you. Uh, and this is why I oftentimes say it's your uniqueness that is your greatest strength, not how well you emulate other people. So if, if you are boring yourself because you're just trying to be unique by a certain process, but it's not like something you're really excited about or like you can't wait to like pick up your guitar and, and, and play or, or record, then that's probably not going to be the right thing because I think there's a certain certain authenticity to the work that is extremely compelling when it is like your true self, no matter how niche or, or quirky it might seem. And so maybe it's like you spend a bit of time like ingesting as much art as possible, experiencing it from, from other people. And then maybe through that, you, you can discover something that you find really exciting or like you say like, wow, I really like this artist or the, the way that these people are approaching the, the craft. I just wish that they could do this. Then maybe that's your particular take on it. And that, that can uh, help shape your artist identity uh, in terms of like the music or even lyrical content um, in terms of like your own artist's like story or biography. Just think like, what are those aspects of yourself that are really unique? Uh, like, what are those stories or experiences that you could share that that other people can't quite claim? Like, if, if it's a story that's really unique to yourself, um, the chances are, like, out of the billions of people on this planet, that, like, it's probably not totally unique. Like, other people probably have something that they can see themselves in. But, like, your particular way of experiencing it, your time your your own path is is definitely unique and so if you lean in on that that could also be a way to to drive like unique content or help inform like 
what that like identity might look like for you in, in a way that like gets you really excited and, and like eh, happy to move. So what are, what, uh, what are some of the things that you've been like thinking about in, in that area? Like, how, have you been like toying with different ideas? Are you still kind of like, or is it just like totally open right now? Um, I've been really, my two favorite genres are probably pop and rap like most people, but I wanna, but I would love to like kind of fuse those in a way that, and I guess rock, indie rock. I also really like indie rock and like a kind of ideal world for, for me would be some finding some way to like fuse those into a really interesting like K-pop, but less chaotic, but, and also better. Yeah. Not to dunk on K-pop, I love K-pop very much, <laughs> but I think that the, but I don't think that the production value of it can be is as high as it like can be. You, you feel like it's sometimes formulaic, maybe. Uh, not only formulaic, but also um, it's like I guess it's a diversity of different styles, right? It's uh, I feel bad that talking to you with my camera off. One second. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, whatever. No, you I don't want you to look. Too <laughs> You're just looking at this blank screen. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, so I was, I've been thinking uh, a lot about how to kind of merge these uh, like styles into something that's more minimalistic than I think K-pop is very maximalist in a way that I enjoy, but and not something that I'm necessarily looking for in my own style. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's really chaotic, the thing that I want, but I think it would be really fun. And it's, the, it's, um, something I look a lot, like I really look forward to making. I've been sending Bao all these songs and like, I wanna do this and I wanna do this. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Actually more accurately, he's like, let's do it. And I'm like, do what? I don't know what I'm doing, but yeah. Well, that's the fun thing about it is like um, creating something new. And so like, if you are really excited about like fusing those different styles or like answering the question, like what would you fix about K-pop? You already have a a pretty good answer of like what it is that moves you and if you're feeling that way the chances are that there's other people who also feel like a very very similar manner and who are maybe looking for that artist and they can't find it so you might as well be the one who, who like provides that experience for them yeah I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how it works musically I have no idea what this sounds like well, I, and that and that's where you kind of begin experimenting, right? Like, so if you're say, okay, how do I blend pop and rap and indie rock, or like, what can I do with with, with K-pop? You said you you want to do something more minimalist. K-pop is really maximalist, so you can maybe begin by like writing similar like K-pop tunes, and then just like slowly removing some of those tracks or stripping it down to its core. Like, what makes it really special? Like, what is it about? these songs that you really like like if you could find a common thread and like what is it that you would change about it so like you could just start there and then maybe like maybe not every song has to be like a fusion of all of these things all at once maybe you have different songs that uh through their expression will some will you know have more of that indie rock feel some might more have more of that rap and hip-hop feel and then through kind of that collection of songs you you start feeling like there's a body of work that you think really represents that idea and, and the reality is like if you're doing something new uh oftentimes you can get a better sense of it as you do it because once when especially like as you're recording a song because like you might like think like oh, i really want to do this thing i don't even know it's possible well once you start recording you can start hearing what's possible and then you can say okay what's what do I need to fix about this kind of thing? And then as you, mm -hmm. the more that you write, the more that you start feeling like, you, you start getting a better sense of like what's working and what's not working in terms of like your ultimate vision and the, and the core idea for this kind of thing. So like if you were, like if you were to kind of remove yourself from music and you're saying, okay, like what if I change the framework of my thinking and say like, I want to create a new restaurant that's a that 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 because i really like mexican food i really like indian food and i really like korean food i would love to see a fusion of that of all those three things because i'm not seeing that out there in the world 
like, what would you do in terms of the restaurant? You'd start saying, okay, like, what are some ingredients that work well with each other within each of these cuisines? How, how can I pair them up in a way that seems authentic and reflects mm. each of these things? And, 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 but in a way that, uh, that highlights what makes it special instead of like a way that's convoluted or like that masks each other then you start playing with those recipes. And maybe it's like, sometimes you add more of one particular spice or, or less of something else until you get a thing that feels pretty good. And maybe you have one dish and then you're like, you know what, that dish is like, it's kind of like Mexican food with like kimchi on it. <laughs> like, yeah. and, and so then you're like, well, I really want to bring out more of this particular thing. And so then you create another dish that maybe is a different combination of ingredients and now it's more Indian, uh, but but still has those elements. So, I mean, in that scenario, you could start thinking like, oh, I can see how like the more I cook, the more I play with ingredients, the more dishes I come up with, so to speak, the more I'll have like the ability to create a menu of things. And then once you do mm -hmm. that, you start thinking, how do I market this restaurant? Well, you know, people understand like what Mexican food is. People know what Korean food is. They know what Indian food is. So like... I can talk about the things that bring them like kind of together and use that, or maybe use uh, something that's familiar to someone to make them feel welcome in, into this place so that they're willing to try out those other dishes. So like, sometimes it helps just getting out of the music industry altogether. Think about like food, think about if this were a retail clothing store or something like that. And like, how would you approach the, these problems? Well, the same mental states and like attitudes that you would kind of put into those things should just be the same that you put into the music because like the same process will kind of work you know at least get you to a starting point where you can be like okay now i feel pretty good about this that's so cool i really really like that idea because um yeah i'm i'm just i'm like thinking about who does like the kinds of things i'm interested in and like picking and choosing like the ingredients that work well together is such a good way to put it. Uh, I'm really excited to start thinking more about those. Thank well, you so much. I'm excited to hear about it. And uh, as Bao dropped in the chat, that someone say spicy, a little mini <laughs> there. <laughs> awesome. Did, did you have additional questions or, or Grant or Gareth? Um, Gareth? he's probably walked away um no uh, nothing uh specific now but i yeah i would, would love to chat with you another time about um about touring and and also about uh the the cause that i talked about um and have a more like uh i guess more specific conversation when my brother's back when, when my brother's all present like he uh yeah but but thank you yeah, no worries very cool uh, and Titania, did you have any other questions or anything like that? Anything? Like, uh, nothing. Anyway? Nothing related to this. Um, but I was. I've been wondering. I played my first ever like paid gig, mm -hmm. like like a month ago, and I was like, "This is so sick!" And I have no idea how to book more gigs. So if you have any like resources or tips on that, I'd really appreciate that. Sure. Uh, well, what kind of gig was it, and what kind of gigs do you want to play? Because it it's a pretty wide field. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I played a like a little a Vietnamese festival, like a new a Lunar New Year festival for the Vietnamese community in San Diego. I have no idea how they found me, but they found my Instagram and they reached out and they're like, "Hey, you want to play for us?" And I'm like, "Sure." Uh, but I think I would I would love to play. I'd love to play like festivals like that, but I'd also love to play um, like shows in clubs and like bars and things like that. Yeah. So most of the time, like, it, do, you, do you have songs that are recorded or, or like videos of you, your performance or things like that? I have. Oh, it looks like you are frozen. Oh. Oh, I'm frozen. This is my internet connection's unstable here. You're just fine. Okay. Um, to tell you, so it sounded like you. Okay. Yeah, I'm back. Okay, back. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Cool. So, so you were saying? 
Yeah, so I was saying that um, I have a collection of music, mostly acoustic or guitar based, and I'd really like to start moving in the more electronic, like, or band based direction. Yeah, well, I would say like whatever it is that you have, if you have like a body of work, um, especially like if you can start creating your own website and if you like mm -hmm. aren't like a web designy kind of person, you can, there are like websites uh, that could be generated specifically for musicians. So Bandzoogle is one of my favorite ones. They have really good mm -hmm. templates. It's drag and drop. It's very easy. And that could serve as kind of like your EPK, your electronic press kit. So uh, as you start reaching out to live music venues, uh, festivals, and that sort of thing, you have a, a very specific place to direct them to. And mm -hmm. oftentimes they prefer like your own website and then some, some other source like could be Spotify, could be Bandcamp or something like that. So you just basically give them two, two options. And I would say kind of begin with like listening rooms, uh, events, and that sort of thing in, in your area and give them like a compelling reason of like why they ought to book you. So in the same kind of spirit of like the collaboration, uh, like building authentic collaboration and relationships, like they have to see a reason of, for, for booking you. And it can't just be mm -hmm. like, cause you write and perform great songs because that's not enough for them. Most of, most venues are making their money by selling drinks or that sort of thing. So you can say like, hey, I'm established in the area. I have friends and family. Uh, so like they, they want to know essentially that you could sell some tickets so that they can sell drinks. So if you could speak to that and you have uh, like some music that they enjoy, um, they're going to be much more likely to, to book you. And if you had a great time playing at the like the Lunar New Year Festival, the, the cool thing is that there are cultural festivals all over the place. You can like just Google them and reach out to their like the committees and then they oftentimes usually pay pretty well or they can provide like you at the very least with like a, a booth so you can collect email addresses sell merchandise and that sort of thing and uh, that's a great way to start building up a fan base so as you're doing those things it makes it a lot easier to book future events because say hey i performed at, at these places or these festivals i would love to play at your venue or, or your festival or event and you just kind of build from there. But I, I, I oftentimes say like, just start like easy, like with, by, by focusing on things very close to you. And, um, you know, the, the more shows that you can play, the more comfortable you'll get with not only performing, but like reaching out to folks because it'll just kind of become like second nature, like on, on booking. So uh, after this, if you want like a booking template email, I'm happy to send you one too. And, and you can oh, just be great. Of, like follow the general format, plug in your information. And like, there's a format that talent buyers generally like, uh, and it's, you know, very, very straightforward. Like, hey, I'm looking for, to, to book a show on this date. You know, then you do like two or three lines about yourself and, you know, so, so, so like you can follow this basic format and they could send you the exact same one that I used for, for myself for uh, almost two decades, as well as like many of the other bands and artists that I've booked for. So um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put my uh, email at, address in the chat here and you can just send me a message and I will be happy to, to send you um my emails but also i'm happy to review yours and like provide you feedback and like uh, suggestions on how you, you can improve your emails as you uh wanting to book uh events as well amazing thank you so much and same thing goes for uh you grant uh like i know you're gonna be like writing a lot of messages soon for for booking your tour as well as those college gigs i'm happy to like review and provide some feedback and that sort of thing too Thank you, brother. I will definitely email you. Awesome. Any any other questions, sir? Uh, super quick one before we go. Uh, what was the name of that punk artist that you said it was like touring and charting? Oh, that's Darrow. I put it in there. Darrow. Yeah. Darrow. He sometimes shows up at these think tank sessions or other foundation events. So he's very very cool to work with. Uh, Bow. And Joe and I like listen to a lot of his mixes and, and provide feedback for him as well. So cool, um, cool. Yeah. Very, very approachable. And he's a, and he's, you know, 
I don't know. He he loves TikTok right now, so he has like <laughs> his videos have a sense of humor. But you can check them out and I will. some ideas from there too. So yeah, I'll do that. Thanks. Thanks so much. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Simon. Yeah. Thanks so much for for being here. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out anytime. And just to let you all know, um, while we did close out the window for the Asian uh, Pacific's radio program, we do have a lot of other programs that are going to be coming up uh, through the Slants Foundation as well. So if you go to the slants.org, um, you know, when we launch new programs, you can just kind of click the programs or what we do tab and, and, and see things. Um, in addition to the artist newsletter that we send out, which will let you know about funding opportunities, mentorship opportunities, and that's that sort of thing. Uh, later this year, we will be launching CPOC Music, which is something we kind of debuted last year. It's the first national music business conference for artists of color. And I think this year we're also going to be looking at like bringing up, like having a performance stage in addition to workshops and things like that. So that's going to be really fun and exciting to work on. Uh, and yeah, you know, again, if you have, even if you are unsure, like where you might fit in some of our programs, you can always reach out to us. And if we can provide some resources or introductions or anything like, you know, we would be more than happy to, so um, thank you again. Thank and you I, so much. Thanks. Have a good night, y'all. You too. Oh. All right.